but now. Okay, we are recording now. It's 104. Um, we're still waiting for a few people. Um, I did just see Maureen come in the door, so I trust she's logging on as we speak. Okay. Um, I've not seen Rob. There's Maureen, okay. So Jessica is the co-host. Uh, we had already uh, discussed this and she will be sharing her screen shortly mm -hmm. as soon as we do our introductions. Um, I'm gonna allow her to have the screen to share the things that they're working on, which she kindly sent around already. So I'm hoping that some people had an opportunity to look through those documents. Um, so, okay, let's go ahead. I'm gonna just read read the name as I have it. Um, and if I missed somebody, let me know. Um, once I say your name, if you can just say a little bit of, of you know, who you are, where you're from. Uh, let's start with Tom Chalmers. Um, hi, uh, Tom Chalmers, Austin Design uh, Architects. And we are the architect for the project. Great, thank you. Uh, Mark Stednicki. <clears throat> yep, Mark Stanicki from FDE Associates with a civil engineering design team on this project. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nate Malloy. Hi, Nate, a planner with the town. Okay, thank you, Nate. Jessica Allen. Uh, hi, Jessica Allen, a project manager here at Valley CDC. Great. Thanks, Jessica. Jason Skeels. Jason Skeels, town engineer, public works. Thank you. Peter at Dodson and Flinker. Yes, I'm Peter Flinker and I'm the landscape architect. Okay, great. Thank you, Peter. Christine Brestrup. Hi, I'm Chris Brestrup, planning director for the town of Amherst. Thank you, Chris. Dave Wiskevitz. Dave Wiskevitz, Senior Building Inspector. Hi, Dave. Laura Baker. Hi, I'm Laura Baker, uh, Real Estate Development Director from Valley CDC. Great. Thank you, Laura. Erin uh, Jock. Erin Jock, Wetlands Administrator for the Town of Amherst. Thank you, Erin. Uh, Maureen Pollock. Hi everyone, um, my name is Maureen Pollock. I am a staff planner and I work with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Okay, thank you, Maureen. All right, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, I just wanna make sure that everybody um, is aware we are recording this meeting. Um, and I have turned over the co-hosting to, at this point, to Jessica Allen. If anybody else uh, desires that privilege throughout the meeting, you can feel free to ask me uh, and I can uh, just click a little button and you'll be able to share your screen. So without further ado, I will mute myself and turn it over to Jessica. Thank you, Jennifer, I appreciate it. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay, can everybody see a slide from I think the PowerPoint that came through? Yes. Uh, okay, great. Um, so just to give you a little bit of site context and where we're at here. So we're very early in the process, um, but we wanna come to you because we have a number of questions regarding utilities, um, some of the future of Ball Lane and Ball Lane's current status, um, stormwater traffic. So really trying to come to you as early as possible so that it helps inform our, our site design as we move forward. Um, as you may know, we purchased the site in August. We've been having some community meetings. We've had one Zoom meeting with the abutters within 300 feet of the site. Um, we attended the District One Neighborhood Association barbecue. Um, earlier this month and, and started to um, present some very schematic site plans and building plans for comment to the neighbors. Um, 
We have an existing conditions plan that our civil team has, um, they've delineated wetlands um, prior to, and they've done uh, the existing, the topography, uh, utility uh, identification. So we have an existing conditions plan, which I'll pull up in a minute. Um, and before purchase, we did due diligence. Um, we had a wetlands consultant come out and give us some opinions regarding the wetlands. Um, and then we did a phase one and a phase two environmental study report um, based on the formal use as a, as a commercial um, trucking and vegetable processing facility. We wanted to make sure that we were working with a, a clean site. So we had about 13 um, soil borings done and had the soil tested. Those locations were where the existing um, underground storage tanks were located and everything came back clean. So um, with that information on the environmentals, we move forward with negotiating and purchasing the site in August. Um, so like I said, we're very early in the design process, but really are looking for town feedback before we get too much farther ahead of ourselves. Um, it's better to, to get these, these questions answered now than to be backpedaling a year from now. So, um, the design concept, uh, right now we are looking to do 30 mixed income duplex homes, um, 15 structures, a mix of two bedroom and three bedroom homes. Um, we are looking to have 20 of these homes deed restricted as affordable homes to purchasers that are between the 80% and 100% AMI um, framework. And then 10 of the, the homes would be sold at market rate. So um, the program that we're looking at, the main subsidy is the Commonwealth Builders Program. Um, this is the only funding source in the state that provides subsidy for affordable home ownership projects. Um, and this site just happens to be located geographically in, a, um, in an area that is eligible for Commonwealth Builders funds. So we're very fortunate that that funding is aligning to, to the location of this site. Um, what we're intending to do from a site design concept is to try to concentrate development and cluster these structures um, where in areas that have already been previously developed by the commercial trucking and the vegetable processing facility um, and trying to preserve the frontage as much as possible. We understand that we're gonna have to utilize some of this area for stormwater um, and we'd like some feedback on that. Um, but uh, building design, we're trying to keep the structures to be pretty small in terms of their footprint. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, one, we want to try to, to keep the, the costs down. Um, construction, as you know, is very expensive right now, so there's, a, so there's a, a financial side to it. We also want to try to create a community here. Um, trying to, to site the homes in such a way that we're building a community um, and engaging people, creating it pedestrian friendly. Um, we're also looking at passive solar as a, as a design of the, of the homes themselves. So what that means is the, the homes are designed to um, capture solar heat in the winter and to shield it in the summer. So, so it helps with the heating and cooling and then helps hopefully reduce costs for the, um, for the maintenance of the home for the heating and cooling systems. Um, we're also looking at photovoltaics as an option as well, again, to bring some of those operational costs down for the, for the um, future home buyer. So first time home buyers um, for those deed restricted units and then the market rate would be open to the market. So that's the general design concept. Um, anybody have questions about the design concept? Okay. Um, I'm going to move over to the existing conditions plan because there's kind of really two big things that we want to be able to discuss um, with the town. And I would say if the, anybody on the design team, feel free to jump in at any time um, to, to supplement what, what I'm saying here. So uh, existing conditions plan, we do have two wetland areas that have been delineated. One of them is a, like a country ditch that over time has become jurisdictional. Um, there's also wetlands back here um, in the slight blue. And you'll see on the existing conditions plans that we've got the 30 no build plus the 50 and 100 buffers represented on the existing conditions. Um, there is an existing house that is on the property. It's about 812 square feet, um, has a existing tenant located in the, um, that's uh, renting the property right now. 
Access to the site is primarily through an existing driveway. So here's, uh, there's two concrete pads. The buildings have been demoed. Um, there's concrete pads that are left there. Um, these are the locations of those two concrete pads. Um, there's driveway access here. There's also access off of Ball Lane right up through this area. Um, on the existing conditions plan, I've highlighted a couple of the utilities, blue being water, um, red being sewer, and orange being drainage. So um, there is an invert here. Um, we have drainage that is coming here, probably contributing to the creation of this wetland uh, down in this uh, section of the site. Um, and then sewer here running down Ball Lane, providing access currently to four Ball Lane, 35 Ball Lane and 177 Montague Road. Um, as I've, I've vetted with Jason a little bit, the size of the pipe is, is a six inch and in which has been confirmed by our civil team. Um, one of the things that we're gonna be asking the town to think about and looking for some guidance here today is understanding that we're gonna likely need to upgrade um, the pipe size to eight inches. Um, and that the most ideal location would be uh, coming in down here off of the, um, after the existing manhole, is a sewer manhole, um, somewhere access in here. And understanding that Ball Lane is a private way with public utilities. Um, and so how exactly is that going to, to work um, in terms of if we need that infrastructure as far as I understand, there's no easement in place. Um, Ball Lane has been in existence, as far as I can tell, from about 1870s, as, as I found it represented on a map going back that far. So um, it's not associated with any of the abutting properties. Um, it really is its own entity, but it has public utilities on it. So um, accessing that and sort of the structure, the legal structure and the town structure of how a private developer would be able to, to potentially upgrade a, a section of this, um, I think is one question that we have. Um, sort of related to that, you know, is there a desire by the town to turn this into a public way? Um, my understanding, I'm getting kind of mixed feedback from residents in this area on whether they do or they do not want it to be upgraded to be a, 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 a public way. There's um, at least one resident who's very adamant of keeping it a private way. So um, I think that's a, a question that we'd like to sort of kick around with you on sort of what's the town's desire there. Um, and, uh, and, and that very much plays a part in terms of our site design and how we intend to access the site. Um, so I'm gonna flip it over quickly to um, to the site options. And Peter, I don't know if you kind of want to walk through any of these for the team in terms of your thoughts and- where Sure, we're if, you, if you just want to go back to that existing conditions plan. Sure. Jess. So you, can Is you go there back somewhere you want me to focus in on? Can you go back to the existing conditions? I'm seeing the- Oh. One of the I should, proposals. I should be on existing conditions, hold on. Oh, I pulled it out of the, there we go. You see it now? Yes. Okay. Um, so what we're trying to do is Jessica said is sort of make as much use as possible as the area that was already disturbed. But the other sort of, if you look at the contours there, there's kind of a knoll high ground on the Eastern part of the site. Um, and what basically what you're gonna see in the concepts is in order to fit the program, we basically have to use that existing area of disturbance and then extend across toward the knoll. The other thing, this is uh, north is toward the top of the, the screen here. So the best way to do the passive solar is to have the, the long sides of the houses facing south, of course. And so what you'll see in the different uh, schemes is a sort of a long east-west access of the project extending from the area that's already developed toward that, toward that knoll. And then there's sort of in the middle of the, the sheet here, you see there's a row of trees, which is less, it's more obvious on the site. It's like a big hedgerow almost. And then there's the large meadow toward uh, Pulpit Hill Road. And so visually that corner from Montague Road and Pulpit Hill Road is very visible and it's beautiful sort of rural scene. 
So in general, we're trying to preserve that as much of that meadow as possible, preserve those trees as screening, and then have the development line up east and west. So if you go to the next one, Jessica. Yep. Um, this is uh, one option, and the idea is uh, it's, it's not going to be a co-housing project um, per se, but we're using that kind of a model where you come in and park at one end or the other of the project and then walk to your unit on a pedestrian system. So the entire interior of the project would be pedestrian only with probably like it's typical with co-housing to have some of that area wide enough, some of those paths wide enough that you could drive an emergency vehicle down them. And then, as you see here, to line the buildings up, uh, largely facing south, to have access off of a sort of a shared open space, uh, and to create sort of private garden spaces on the front of the house, sort of facing the entrance, and then on the back, have private patio spaces. And then to create some kind of a system of shared walkways that could be used by people in the community. So this is uh, one example that has an access off of uh, Ball Lane on the south. Uh, and then a, another short access and parking lot off of Pulpit Hill Road. The, uh, the next one, uh, sort of a similar iteration of that, but this case has the access directly off Montague Road with a parking lot at one end. And then again, a parking lot and access off of Pulpit Hill Road. And, and this one has, puts a cul-de-sac at the end of uh, Ball Lane, but doesn't have major access other than to that existing home that's at the end of Ball Lane. And here we've sort of split that off on its own lot. Um, now this is probably about a, a half or a three quarter acre lot, so it doesn't meet the zoning requirements. Uh, you would have to square it off and sort of run all the way to the Eastern corner to, to meet the required lot size. So this is a question we have to to figure out if we're gonna split that off, can we use a smaller lot? And then the next one shows a similar uh, kind of two parking clusters at either end with a long um, sort of access path in between them and then access to the individual homes. And so you're starting to see uh, what we think of as probably kind of the ideal diagram and that it's uh, the most efficient diagram, try to reduce pavement, provide access, reasonable walking access from both ends to the different clusters of houses, and then provide some shared open space within the clusters, as well as preserving that, uh, the meadow along Pulpit Hill Road. And we have one more? We do have one more. Oh, we have one more. So this is another uh, more recent one, which has a somewhat smaller footprint for the buildings, um, which has sort of been evolving. And this, the, the bright yellow is sort of, um, we're thinking about solar access around primarily on the south side, but also on the east and west sides of the buildings. And in this case, uh, that long pedestrian access connecting the two parking areas and then a series of uh, sort of pedestrian spaces and access to the buildings as you go through. So we're trying, you know, from a design perspective, of course, we're trying to make this an interesting um, uh, layout that, that will fit into the kind of irregular New England development context, uh, but also for purposes of efficiency to try to duplicate as much as possible the floor plans of the different buildings. And uh, Tom has been working hard on trying to do that. Um, so this, actually, this one you might note, uh, we're sort of assuming probably the easiest thing all the way around is not to have any access to the site from Ball Hill Road. So this uses uh, sort of the existing access and a new access off of Pulpit Hill Road. Again, sort of short driveways to parking lots, get people out of their cars and then not have to have access from Ball Lane at all. Um, I do wanna just jump back real quickly to zoning because, um, and I'm gonna go to the existing conditions plan because it shows that it is a split zone. So there's a split zone here and we anticipate going under Chapter 40B in order to hit the density requirements and, um, to build where the existing disturbance has already happened. So um, based on my analysis of the zoning, and I did a preliminary confirmation with Nate a long time ago on numbers, um, you know, if we were to, if somebody was to build 
use in within this zone, they could fit 35 units in, in a cluster subdivision on this front area. But since we're trying to protect that area and protect the views and protect the character of the site and build towards the back, the zoning um, would only allow eight units back here. So that's why we anticipate going through a 40B process to basically flip the, flip the development densities to have the concentration of the development towards the back, tuck it away, tuck it away from site of the public ways and try to preserve that front. Um, our thoughts are um, if, we do in, if we do end up splitting off this existing single family home and selling it, which is where we've been headed, um, my thought is that the um, dimensional requirements that would be needed under the ANR could be incorporated as part of that 40B package. So a reduced, um, you know, um, lot size. So not hitting a 200 foot frontage requirement with a two acre um, minimum lot size, but really shrinking that down. And I think the it it does make sense because most of these abutters along Ball Lane do not meet zoning requirements and have had special permits or variances in the past in order to build in this location. So it seems consistent to request an ANR to be that smaller um, dimensional requirement and potentially a reduced frontage along Ball Lane. Um, Ball Lane being a private way, I did again confirm with Nate early on that we'd be able to pull um, frontage off of Ball Lane and he indicated that we would. Um, and I think that's because that's been consistently been the practice along Ball Lane um, for these other for these other um, lots. So just wanted to put that out for from the planning side and the zoning side. Um, we can stop there for right now and answer any questions, or I'd love to hear some just preliminary feedback from town staff. Hi, this is Nate. Just a quick question on the concepts you're showing: sixteen buildings. Which would be thirty-two, and so I don't know. Yep. You know, is it does it is the, is you know thirty a hard number, or is there like a community no, building in there? We're kind of fluxing between thirty, thirty-two. It's really going to depend on how the numbers pencil out. Um, with construction pricing so high, it makes it a little bit difficult to kind of recoup, especially for a subsidized unit. Um, the gap between what we're able to get in subsidies versus the construction costs is pretty significant, um, and the Commonwealth Builders Program will not be able to fill that gap. Um, and Commonwealth Builders also doesn't allow us to go request any other additional soft debt from DHCD. So we're a little bit, um, you know, need to be able to fill that gap. So probably when we get a permit application together, we may end up having a plan with 32 units on it with an understanding that we may not be able to build one of those units and one of them may be removed to due to financing at some point. Sure. And then the other one is... Um... Ball Lane is actually out part of this property. So on your maps, you're showing like a dotted line that it's not, but it is. It's part of the Matusco property. No, it is not. According to our GIS, it is. And our your records. GIS is incorrect. <laughs> so um, I did a bunch of deed research on Ball Lane, and I'm happy to send you what I have. Um, there are lots and lots of plans in the plan book in the deed that show Ball Lane and all of the legal descriptions for all of the parcels use Ball Lane as their boundary line. So I know the GIS is reflecting one thing, and I think we actually talked about this a little bit, Nate. Right. Um, but our, but um, and maybe Mark can speak to it, but when they did the existing conditions, we made sure and had them dig in <clears throat> to see whether it was part of the deed, and we had our legal team look at it as well, and it is not reflected as part of the of this property. So. I have it's a like question. A, it's like an anomaly. It's like, you know, out right. there all on its own. It's very bizarre. I have a question about the single family house and the mm -hmm. desire to sell the single family house separately. And I wondered, um, I think we're going to need to talk to Co uh, Copeland and Page KP Law about how that fits in with the um, comprehensive permit. We'd want to make okay. sure that that could be included in the comprehensive permit in order to get the okay. um, waivers from the dimensional requirements. Okay. If it comes back that they do not believe it could be part of the 40B process, would we, if we wanted to section it off, would we just put in a variance requirement? Like how would be, or would you be expecting that the site would have to meet the dimensional requirements? Um, 
you need to meet some pretty rigorous uh, criteria in order to get a variance in Amherst. So, you know, you need to think about how you would describe what the hardship is. Mm -hmm. And the hardship has to do with the land. So, um, you know, if you want to review what the criteria are and then think about how you could, okay. you know, use those criteria to justify a variance, you're yep. welcome to do that. But Amherst, generally speaking, doesn't grant variances. Okay. And so the the parcels that were approved over the past couple decades across the street on Ball Lane that had special permits through the ZBA. Don't, don't know how those were approved. Okay. So we would have to look at um, any kind of permits that those may have had. Okay. Do we know Jessica, Erin has her hand up. Oh, right, Erin. I just I have a couple of questions. I think they could be answered relatively quickly. Um, what is sure. the overall lot size here? Sure, it's eight point three three acres. Great. And um, the uh, wet swale that runs along Pulpit Hill was there any flow detected in that? Not I at have... the yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Um, not at the time of flagging or at the time of survey. Okay. Thank you. Um, the meadow was that checked for hydric soils? Yes, it was flagged by Dan. Oh, not Dan. One of Ward Smith of Wetland, uh, Wendell Wetland Services. Okay, he walked through the entire property and delineated what he found. Okay, but he did check the the meadow for wet soils specifically. That it's not no wet meadow soils in there. Um, I mean, it's I a pull up his report, but I believe he did. Okay, great. Um, I also I just wanted to point out that the buffers have changed. We recently updated our bylaw on um, June twenty second, and so the um, setbacks have changed a little bit. So just wanted to point that out. And then, um, have you guys done any test pits? Or are you planning to do test pits prior to submitting permits to the town? Um, okay, we Wonderful. have a test pits scheduled for the eleventh. Okay, um, the 11th of, of yeah, October. Next week. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, yeah. that's good. Just because um, we've been having a lot of permits coming through where people have not been doing um, test pits in advance and it slows down the permitting process pretty significantly and it bogs down the Conservation Commission with continuation. So anything mm -hmm. we can do to do that in advance is appreciated. Sure. Um, I guess the last question was just stormwater, um, what you guys have in mind for stormwater to compensate for the impacts? Mark, do you um, want to take that? Yeah, as of right now, I was planning on doing shallow basins um, within the green space and have overflow that travels kind of to the or downstream to that north um, western corner and have a larger detention basin within that area along the right away of um, Montague Road and try to detain as much as I can or water in that area and then have an emergency overflow that will go to the existing um, swale that's along Pulpit Hill and Montague Road. And when you say basins and detention, are you talking um, like uh, sort of water quality swales? Are we talking infiltration basins? Just be a mix of all of that, hopefully. Okay. Got it. As of now, if they do the driveway and parking area along the northeastern corner, I was planning on doing like a quality swale or water quality swale along that and just sheet flowing it across the field after it goes to the quality swale um and then catch storm water within the units to um match the info or get the required infiltration and within like infiltration basins and that sort of thing Okay, I just want to make sure that there's going to be multiple treatment systems in the treatment train. Like if you come in with just a water quality swale, it might not provide adequate treatment. But if you do something ahead of that, like a uh, sediment four bay or something, then you might be able to get your treatment for both of those systems. Um, just 
just trying to make sure that we again it's we with the concom when we get a plan that like for example with a treatment train that doesn't meet 80 percent tss we're looking at a complete redesign and so every treatment train in the project for each drainage area should have 80 percent tss removal um just just want to underline that a little bit thank you anything else aaron on your Radar, how do you yeah. feel about an access off Popefoot Hill Road? I mean, if word has checked the soils and it's um, determined that there's no wet soils up there, I would feel pretty confident in that. I guess my only concern would be to, to check and double check for culvert inlets and outlets, make sure that there's no culvert existing underneath that um, section of the roadway or coming in from the other from the north side of pulpit hill just to figure out where water's coming from and where it's going um, as much mm -hmm. as we can sort of in the due mm -hmm. diligence phase because we've had another situation where um it's very similar actually on route 116 something like this and the connection between the wetlands was a a culvert which had been crushed and they told me there was no culvert and I got out on site and found one side there was a culvert on the other side it was collapsed and covered over with sediment so now they have to incorporate a culvert replacement in their plan design um, so just anything like that that you can um, stake out and um, address on the initial run through would be awesome that way we're not dealing with multiple continuations it'll save everybody money sure so there is an existing culvert right here in between the two. Oh, for farm access. Yeah, there's the existing culvert that's there, but we would be proposing an entrance to the east of that where it, there is not currently a swale. It just... Right. I'm just wondering, like, there's got to be a source for that water. Like, where is it coming from? It might be sheet flowing off of that field, which is fine. And if there's no culvert inlet to the um, sort of the higher gradient end of the of the swale, then and you guys have investigated that, it's fine. Just want to make sure that it's been looked at and we sort of know what the lay of the land is before we get out there and do a site visit. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was shot during the survey, it shows that the field is mostly the feeding so source of that swale. The road um, is actually pitched away to the opposite side. Yeah, but there's nothing from the other side of the road going under the road that's feeding that. Okay. Not until you get to the end of Pulpit Hill, which gotcha. is, uh, is is there any encroachment on the buffers with this project? Or are you guys pretty well staying out of? We're we're trying to stay out of it. I, I think uh -huh. if you look at Peter's site concepts, um, the this entrance is trying to stay outside that buffer area. However, mm -hmm. we have I I will know we've met with this landowner directly. Um, we showed them preliminary site plans, and no surprise, they're hoping that the entry would get shifted. So. Um, you know, I don't know how how we feel about, you know, if we can get into the 100 foot buffer and we can push a little bit just to give him some comfort. Um, well, I'll just throw out there an idea, which is um, that if that farm access culvert where that little wetland is um, yeah, right here, there you could do a restoration and daylight that section of the culvert as a compensation for the Buff, uh, buffer zone encroachment. We love to see mitigation projects. Um, so if you're proposing impacts in the buffer, that would be a really great way to compensate for that. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. That's helpful. You had mentioned uh, uh, the, the existing null. Are you going to be cutting into that? Or are you going to be working with the uh, topography? And is that also in the wetland or part of it in the wetland buffer? So Peter, I think you've been trying to stay out, right? I, largely, I think. Yeah, I mean, we haven't looked in detail at the grading, but it's it's pretty modest. Um, so we wouldn't expect a lot of a lot of regrading, but I, I wouldn't doubt that we'll be pushing a little bit into that buffer. Certainly not behind beyond the the tree line or close to the tree line, but. Mm -hmm. 
what are the implications of that for you? Uh, well, uh, I mean, if there's any uh, cut and fill, we would need to see um, those calculations and have a, a, a plan um, indicating the quantity. Um, but yeah, perhaps um, if this is like minimal, um, we would see if that would um, there would be a requirement to provide that or not. Um, in terms, I so I noticed that you have the parking areas. Um, so you don't have, you know, parking spaces adjacent to each unit. Um, right. Will any of these units be uh, fully ADA accessible? Um, so, Tom, do you want to talk about the building plans at all? You're on mute. Um, yeah, we can get into that. But before we do, if I, the, one of the house types is a one story, two bedroom that will be laid out so it could be fully accessible. Okay, yeah, so I, I, if I just get to the question, uh, are, are there um, any, I try to quickly look on the AAB uh, regulations, are there any requirements about, you know, length, what is, is there a maximum length between parking area to uh, units in terms of, an, uh, particularly for an ADA unit? Well, since these are, I don't think it falls, this, since these are home ownership, uh, one and two family home ownership, I don't think it's covered by 520 and CMR. There are distances if we're just trying to comply. I can't quite remember what they are, but it's, I think it's like within 200 feet or something. Um, on this plan, for instance, that top left unit uh, was one of the ones that could be accessible. That's right by the parking. Um, okay. And then same on the, on the right side, um, both of those two could be also easily those are sort of designed to be fully accessible so they are also the closest ones to the parking okay yeah i just see that being so, such like the the like the first question for yeah. those so th thinking there's about easily ADA. there's easily four or five units that you know are within less not very far from the parking certainly mm -hmm. less than that couple hundred square uh, feet yeah and then again there's 30 units total so are these parking lots do you envision having um two parking spaces per unit, um, which would well, be we, 60, or, or would, uh, there are provisions that could allow you to have less. Um, yeah, we've been bouncing back and forth. There is an, an active bus stop mm -hmm. um, right at the corner of Pulpit Hill and Montague Road. So there is public transportation available there. There's also another bus stop that's down the street across from the um, co-housing. So there's mm -hmm. two bus stops. Yeah pretty close by. Um, I think we were kind of landing within a one and a half to two parking mm -hmm. um, per home. Yeah. yeah what's, what's shown here is um, 32 units and two spaces per unit because we figured 30. start with the extreme example and then see if it fits. So we can easily uh, sort of dial that back. I think also I would like to see, you know, if there's overflow parking uh, that it could be pervious pavements and do some of it paved and some gravel, so on. Yeah, uh, so uh, if you um, haven't looked at the parking section, we just updated it back in last December, I guess, uh, under 7.000. I guess this would be under a 40B, so you could ask for waivers. But um, there are there is a section, um, part of that section gets into what uh, uh, we call a sh uh, shadow parking. So if you feel that, um, you know, majority of the time we, you know, you, you, you only feel like you need, you know, we'll throw out, we only need 50 parking spaces, but perhaps for holidays or gatherings a few times a year, you'll, you, you may need uh, overflow parking that could be gravel or ground cover or, or, or something like that. That's something you can uh, think about. But um, in context of, um, you know, the um, the bus line, you know, we would if you are going to sort of capture that as part of your proposal, it uh, you know what would be important to the board to know is is there a connection, is there access, how would uh, to that bus stop? So is there uh, for these homeowners um, to that bus stop? So is there a, a public sidewalk? Um, to get from this property for these homeowners to get to the bus stop. Um, and if there isn't, is that something um, that you would want to sort of th um, think about um, uh, 
um, I don't uh, think thinking about whether that could be, you know, um, perhaps being a, a conversation with with uh, the board of adding maybe a, a public walkway. Yes, yeah, similar feedback than, uh, that we received when we did our community um, outreach at the barbecue. We heard a number of people asking if they're in these units, how are they getting to the bus stop? So that's definitely on our radar screen. Mm -hmm. um, there's no public sidewalks out here, mm -hmm. is my understanding, on either Montague Road or Pulpit Hill Road. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Well, on, the west, on the west side of Montague Road, isn't there? Only out to, yeah, the, yeah, it makes it to um, Cal's Lane and the next house down. And um, isn't Montague Road a state highway? Correct. So they would have to negotiate with the state about putting up sidewalks there, right? Yeah, throw their complete streets back at them. <laughs> and I uh, just a quick question. You, uh, Jessica, you mentioned that you'd want to stay away from Ball Lane, but why wouldn't you want to use that as a driveway? Um, you know, to access the the site. Um, well, I think it, it gets into complications in terms of future maintenance and costs. So, you know, if we were going to use that as a main access road, then that road would have to be completely redone, um, sub bases, top coats, base coats, like the it would have to be a, a more formalized road. The budget is tight enough as it is that I don't think we can accommodate as the development team the cost to upgrade Ball Lane to accommodate the site. So that's that's part of it. Um, two, there seems to be not a consensus for the folks that actually live on Ball Lane on whether they want it upgraded or not. So I have heard from one homeowner very adamantly saying he prefers it to have a gravel road. He doesn't want anybody coming down Ball Lane. He likes it that way. However, they have also expressed concern knowing that the, the town is trying to no longer maintain snow plowing and that sort of thing for, for private ways. So, you know, I think that's, if, if, the, if there was a desire on behalf of the town and I guess the neighbors to upgrade it to a public way, then I think that would have to be a discussion that we would have need to have with the town if there was some sort of cost share, because it's not something we certainly could support under our budget at this time. Um, we also think that having an access from the driveway plus ball lane, it's just so much pavement up in that section. And when we were looking at the site plans, it's like we should either pick one or the other. It should either be just ball lane or it should be the access driveway um, that already exists. And we've been kind of just landing on on um, the access driveway. So, you know, we, we haven't made a final decision and we're kind of hoping that you could help guide us because it's our assumption that the town is gonna wanna have two points of access to the site, that fire and police are gonna want that. Is that a, is that a correct that's assumption? That's probably accurate. Without, without fire here, that's probably accurate. And so, then, yeah, go ahead, Jason. Oh, then ball, getting ball lane up to subdivision standards has its challenges as well because it's got a 25 foot pinch point as you enter the first two properties are 25 feet apart and sub subdivision rules require minimum of uh, the metric equivalent of 50 feet 49 I think it's 49 and a half feet uh, right of way so there would that'd be the first stumbling block is the was the width requirement um, the rest of it could be built up to subdivision standards with the the cul-de-sac that you showed um, earlier in one of the one of the proposed schemes or one or two. Um, so it it is doable. Uh, the town we're either going to stop maintaining it as a private way, or it needs to be accepted as a public way if we and paved if we want to continue maintenance of it. So I think that's our two options, and I see. Yeah, I, I understand where you're where you're coming from with the cost part. Obviously, um, you need to. And I don't know if years. anybody has history of this, but it looks like, according to your Amherst Street history mm -hmm. database on your website, which is awesome, by the way. I wish all mm -hmm. towns had that. Mm -hmm. um, it said it was proposed as a town way in March 1941, and it was um, the article was dismissed. Ooh. So I just think that's kind of interesting that at one point the town did look to yeah. to accept it and then decided not to, and it'd be interesting to understand. Yeah, why and if those are, 
if it if it's just politics or if there was something specific with the site that still applies today, I don't know, but mm -hmm. I, I, I just find that to be a little bit interesting. Um, yeah. In terms of the sewer upgrades on Ball Lane, presuming we're going to need to do something and yep. presuming it stays a private way with public <laughs> utilities, with no legal easements in place, <laughs> How did how would we make how would that all work? How would that how would that that is tricky, especially with Ball Lane being its own weird little entity with no clear ownership? That yeah, I, oh. I can I can send you guys what I have. That would be helpful, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But wouldn't wouldn't the answer. but wouldn't the derelict fee statute apply so everyone who owns to it owns to the center line? Mm -hmm. So then they're whoever wherever it falls, that's that's it's their responsibility. So um you know, even if you don't want to continue using it, you're still going to be in a butter to it. So that, you know, Valley, your property is always going to have some responsibility for that. Um, there's a hydrant at the end of Ball Lane too. So I guess, Jason, I was wondering like if they, you know, even if they wanted to not continue using it, they're going to have, I mean, at some point we have to figure out what's happening, right? With the water, sewer and everything else down there, right? Yeah, if I don't have an easement, I can just cut them and cap them at Montague Road and stop worrying about it. That's gonna. That's gonna. <laughs> Obviously, kidding. Not paying um, out very well for you. <laughs> no. Um. So yeah, we like the next. The next. You know, the the next argument would be a, we have a prescriptive easement. It's been there for X number of years. We've maintained it. We've we've taken care of the sewer there. We've taken care of the water there. We blow off the hydrant. So the the legal argument is that it's been there long enough that we have a prescriptive easement for the right to maintain the water and sewer. Um, we even replaced the water in, when did we do that? That was like one of the first CAD plans I ever drew, and I don't think I put a date on it. No, no date. Um, but yeah, it was somewhere in 99, I think. We replaced the water main over there because um, it was blowing out of the ground. Um, so that's when we installed the six-inch ductile main. Um, so, and just to add to the, so yeah, we can look into upgrading the sewer, whether it's funded by you or funded by some sort of grant uh, application. I don't know if that would fall into your alley, Nate. Um, and then as far as the water main goes, since you are running all the way over to uh, Pulpit Hill Road, we would love to try and get that water main looped over to Pulpit Hill Road. Okay. So that there would be a connection between Ball Lane and Pulpit Hill to, so that you're not, uh, taking water off of dead end water main for all 32 houses. I was going to, um, yeah, that was going to be proposed that the water main would be looped okay. with shutoffs on both sides, obviously. Yeah, that would be great. We'd, we'd like that. It improves so coming off of quality. here somewhere? Up, yeah, up off yeah you could come right down your driveway entrance. Okay. Yeah. You'd, fire, fire department would probably want a hydrant somewhere in that area anyways. Um, but somewhere, uh, somewhere yeah, 150, 150 feet right within the new from the new buildings, right? On, on probably both ends. 30 feet from the new within 100 feet, but no closer than 30 feet. Yeah. Of the new buildings. And then what about sewer, Jason? Can they do they need a pump or can that how does that work? On that I, site? We're the, hoping not. They, they'd have to tell me if they've figured out how to make it by gravity all the way, but it's it's tight. I mean, I see you're on a ridge line, and yeah, that's possibly doable but yeah you'd have to prove it to me i guess <laughs> so mark you've taken a look at this right because we've we've had conversations of pulling off of ball lane and then what if it made sense to try to talk to the town talk to the state running sewer down montague road and pulling down that way but your assessment showing that ball lane is the most ideal location based on uh topography correct correct and you can Gravity sewer most of the proposed units. Um, there might be a few that need to be pumped out to the main. Um, I won't know until we finalize the um, layout and get to it. I mean, I can get to, I would propose running, uh, putting a new sewer manhole, probably like 10 feet off of that, the full ball lane property line on the existing main mm -hmm. thing from that manhole back to Montague Road with eight inch mm -hmm. and then do a 
spur off into some place oh, along the property line to try to collect all of the higher elevation houses. And then we'll see which houses need to be pumped at that point. Okay. None of this will, any of these upgrades are not going to impact these two abutters, right? I mean, it's only actually benefiting them at the end of the day because they have a larger pipe size that'll be now being installed past their house. Yeah, less chance of a backup for sure. Mm -hmm. Although more flow, I don't know. It, it's, a, it's a weighted equation. There's okay. more flow, so there's more chances of a backup, but there's bigger pipe with less chances of a backup. So I don't know where that, it's got a plus okay. and a minus. Call and then, more. yeah, and then just um, going back to like the 63, I know there's an existing driveway onto it, but would mass DOT, if, if you don't use ball lane at all as a driveway, I mean, what is it just an access permit? Um, or is there any, would you have any problems, Jason, with having a new driveway, um, you know, just, just, you know, north of ball lane that serves, you know, 30 homes, or is that not? Yeah, it used to serve a trucking company. So, yeah, I mean, mass DOT would probably want, you know, they'd probably it's probably still want a state highway access permit just because it's a big change in use you're changing from you know commercial trucking with with i don't know how many trucks they had there 10 or 20 ish um to uh, residential um mm -hmm. and there's going to be traffic generation there so they would want they'd want their permit as well if it did come off of uh montague road okay so even if we're still using the existing curb cut location not changing curb cut location we'll still need to get a permit because it's a change of use I think so. You'd have okay. to check with DOT, we'll but I, they, I believe that's how they function. Yeah, okay. the okay. change in use. Okay. We we'll also have to get an access permit, anyways, for any construction that's happening within Montague yeah. Road. Yeah, for the sewer to even go into Montague Road to upsize to eight inch requires that access permit as well. Okay. Um, speaking of traffic, will you guys want to have a traffic impact memo or study? I mean, it's. 30 homes, what's your thoughts? Do we, we wouldn't need to do a full traffic I think a, assessment. I think a memo would be okay. What's that, a, a memo? I think a memo would be okay. There's the developments closer to you are having far greater impacts. Yeah, and then if the, at the public, during the public hearing, if the ZBA, you know, requests more than that, then, um, then we'll deal with it then. But yeah, I, okay. I would say, what Jason recommends is okay. it, it would be fine. Oh, okay. before I before I forget, can, uh, doubling back to the test pits on the eleventh, can you send me a time and a um for that? I I I I'd like to witness those test pits. Sure, or someone yeah. from my staff. That would be uh, awesome. Um, Mark is coordinating that. Um, and Mark, I don't know if you've marked up a a site plan at all of where you intend to do test pits based on what you're thinking for stormwater. I have, and I can send that to him. Um, I plan on being out there at 8 a.m. on the 11th. The 11th? Okay. okay, I'll put that in my calendar now. I've also just for town officials, because I know phone calls come in from abutters. So I have notified um, uh, Jeff and Sarah Lombardi who live on Pulpit Hill Road. So they've been notified of the test pits. I've also notified Meg Gage. She lives across the street from the site. So she's got her network. Um, and I've also uh, let the district one counselors know as well in case constituents call them to ask what's what's happening out there. They're building already. Ah. So Aaron, did you have your hand up? I was just gonna ask Jason. Jason, do you like to attend test pits on private properties? Just because yeah. I, what's that? I try to do it for every single one because I don't. You do. There's a lot of ways to interpret soils. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Like Thank to you. Just verify what they're calling estimated seasonal and weeping and standing groundwater. There's a lot of interpretation that can go into those. I missed yeah. some this morning on North Pleasant Street that they called the schedule with me, but I was short staffed and overwhelmed. Was that Barry Roberts? Um, no, it was 778, 800 North Pleasant. I think it's a frat house that's been undergoing a ton of construction or like basically a full rebuild. Recently. Oh, are you talking about down on Olympia? No, no, no. Uh, no, I know what you mean. Just north of campus. Okay, okay. Never mind. Yep. Sorry, I didn't mean to take that time away. I just That's okay. That's okay. Clarify. And then Thank for you. this property, just I mean, I was looking at the GIS. I mean, there is like 50, 40 to 50 feet, right? Um, of green space between the 
edge of pavement and the property line as you go north. And so, you know, if there was any sidewalk proposal, it looks like there is room, right? At least to get to that first entry drive. Okay. Um, okay. You know, or make you know maybe make it make it up to Pulpit Hill, but I don't I don't know what, what's you know if that it doesn't if, look like um, there's any, any utilities we, in there. If we ran like a path through the site and then got it to the intersection, would you would it be okay just to have like a crosswalk marking that would go from the corner of our property across the street rather than doing sidewalks? Can't have a crosswalk without a sidewalk. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. I don't know if the building inspector wanted to look at, oh, he's got his hand up. Probably want to look at the building plans. Um, probably not as critical right now. Um, okay. They're pretty standard two family homes with okay. hers rating. So it's uh, pretty basic, basic. Um, I just wanted to make you aware that when the previous owner had demolition permits for those structures, they opted not to remove the concrete um, floors and foundations. But one of the conditions we stipulated is that they would have a soils engineer available when they did, just to be sure that there wasn't anything that was dumped, or I don't know if there's any floor drains, but something that potentially could be under there, even though you did have some test pits done, I just don't know where they were in relation to the structures. So, okay. and whether or not um, that, not having the exposure to rain and everything or whatever with that concrete maybe makes a difference um, with the current status. So somebody okay. should be aware that that should be checked. Okay, thank you for that. If we're talking about buildings, I mean, my only thought was that um, you do mention in interior and exterior storage. And so I know the site plan looks nice and neat now, but if you're going to have like all the little dog houses everywhere, I call them no, for storage. So, yeah, let me just pull up. So really it has to do with um, if this is a, this is the first floor. So this is looking at the two story, three bedroom on this side. This is the one and a half story, two bedroom on this side. So this this unit would be 1160 square feet. This one's 1310. This is just the ground floor. So having, um, being able to enter and then have some interior storage here, kind of it could be a mud room, could be however they decide to use it. Um, but using this kind of um, break between the two buildings, Tom has um, created a division so that from the exterior, you could store bicycles and gardening equipment and that sort of thing. So um, what we're trying to prevent is a bunch of sheds going in after we've already sold all the units, after you know we are no longer um, a part of this project, that it's really the home ownership and the condo association. We're trying to, to um, provide those amenities now so that all of a sudden, all these random sheds just don't start popping up and kind of change the dynamic of the site. Sure. And then quickly, is the three bedroom a one and a half bath or is it just a one bath? Tom, do you remember? You're on mute, Tom. I think there were two baths. Right. They're, they're, they're all one and a half baths at a minimum. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Yeah. So. And then keeping with the topic of amenities, it's, um, you know, it, it, it'll, um, as this design continues um, further along, it, it'd be interesting to see if, if you're offering any site amenities uh, on the property, um, like outside, are there any community gardens, walking paths? So I think our thought right now um, is that we may not have, again, the money to be able to construct like a community house or something like that. We've, um, somebody did put out the idea at the, at the community barbecue about having a pavilion, which I think makes sense that if they wanted to, to turn that into a, an enclosed room at some point, they would have the ability to do that. Um, we, we may have set-asides on the plan, so we may not be building a playground ourselves or building community gardens ourselves, but we may have set-asides that are set out on the plan to allow the homeowners to really, we want them to, to take ownership of this, mm -hmm. um, you know, at the end of the day, that this is going to be their community and their condo association. And so, um, you know, we want them to have the ability to sort of build it out to what they need as they live there and as the experience um, being there. So um, we may not be building playgrounds or building a community house, but we may be doing some set aside so that that could happen in the future and there's accommodated for. 
Can we go back to the single family house for a minute? And um, I wanted to ask you the question of why you wanted to separate it out, because you could potentially get the Zoning Board of Appeals to declare that it's a complementary use. And so from a zoning standpoint, you wouldn't need to cut it out. But if you're um, interested in you know making more money as a result of selling it, that's a different thing. But I just wanted to bring that um, forward that it could be considered part of this 40B as a single family house. Yeah, and that well, would we, be under section 3.01 if you want to take a look at that. Yeah. Section 3.01, you said? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we, we need to think about that. Again, it's coming back to sort of the community aspect of it. And we were, we've been kind of kicking around like, you know, how would somebody feel being part of this house that was built in the 50s that needs a lot of work and a lot of renovation? You know, will they feel like they're part of this community? You know, would they, like, we need to sort of figure out how that would kind of work um, so that it doesn't feel like they're ostracized and they're just kind of like, on the side, you know, do they want to be part of this community or do they want to be by themselves? So we're still kind of kicking that around, but it's thank you for flagging the zoning that would allow us to kind of incorporate it in the design as needed. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Sure. You, well, you, you said, Jessica, so that I know, yeah, I was saying the house needs a lot of work and you said it's only 800 square feet. Is it worth yeah. saving or is it, is it, you know, it's um, interesting. The woman who's lives there now, she's been there for about five years. She's a single mom. She loves it there. She loves that house um it needs a lot of work so we've had some very preliminary discussions with her about would she be interested in purchasing this house would she like to move from being a renter to being an owner i don't know if she's got the financial capability to do that but we've got first time home buyer counseling here we have financial literacy like we could totally help set her up so that in five years, when we're kind of ready to go, she potentially could buy the house if she really wants to be there and stay there. Um, so, you know, and again, we've been with our site design, like we've got variations where the house is gone and we don't have it anymore. Um, and we've demoed it and it's not part of the development. So again, it's like, you know, this whole project is to help first time home buyers. And here we have a single mom first, you know, potential first time home buyer. <laughs> we're going to boot her out so that we can have other first time home buyers. So, um, you know, we're trying to figure out programmatically and from a community standpoint, like what makes the most sense. And like I said, she loves that house. She loves being there. So I hate to sort of sell it out from under her, but, you know, we do have it in the pro forma to sell it um, as one of the sources of revenue. Um, so again, it's something we're still kind of playing with, but I have had some preliminary discussions with her. So, right. I just think, cause if you're not, if you don't want to use ball lane, I mean, the only, right. I mean, the way you're have your site design then is that you still, this house would have access from ball lane. Right. So, so it wasn't, you know, it's just a, it's kind yeah. of an anomaly to the site design. If Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. It is a little bit of, um, a little bit of a weird thing, but we're still trying to kind of hash out what makes the most sense. And we'd like to try mm -hmm. to help as many people as we can, if we can do it. So. so yeah, and looking, it will be, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, if you're looking for input, we haven't had a chance to discuss this, you know, among ourselves, but my initial reaction is to avoid using Ball Lane and use those other two access points that you have off Montague Road and off Pulpit Hill Road. That seems to make the most sense to me. It's just cleaner and it keeps it all on your site. It seems mm -hmm. like Ball Lane is a can of worms and, you know, I think it, it's going to be, it, it could be done, but it'd be hard to do it. And, and just to piggyback on what Chris was saying, so Nate had mentioned about you had speculated that each of those owners along Ball Lane has the responsibility of maintaining up to maybe the center line. Yeah, try to tell them that. So I, I would say that that needs that this conversation, this item needs to be fleshed out. Um, Especially if the know. planning department wants to plow it. Yeah, well, I, I would just say that this needs to be fleshed out uh, for the, you know, in time of the public hearing um, for these interested parties to better understand, um, you know, what's happening to Ball Lane and who's responsible. And I'm sure that will be an item of interest um, for those residents. Um, so that, that would um, really, really would need to be fleshed out. And then with that, it's like, would an easement be needed 
to clarify that what what is the what is the document that that would prove or disprove that for these um, homeowners along Ball Lane? Well, I think yeah. from the town's perspective, I like the tech the approach Jason has. Like we have a prescriptive easement for the utility maintenance, but not actually for the road maintenance, right? So there's a difference, right, Jason? I mean, that's really what it is. And there is, but and so um, yeah, I, I think that's something we definitely have to look into. Um, in terms of the overall development, I mean, I think. I don't know what, but you had the response you had from like the neighborhood one barbecue, but you know, we like the concept. I like the concept, right? And we've talked about it before, but I think it's a nice approach to the site and site design. Um, but then, you know, there's all these little pieces like, we're, you know, we've mentioned, right? Like utilities and amenities and sidewalks and different things, but the overall idea is really great. Um, I like the home ownership piece, uh, something that the town's talked about, affordable home ownership. So I think there's a lot of good things going. Um, and then I know you, Jessica, you um, did present this to the trust. And I just wanted to have you maybe mention a little bit about timeline, just so we're sure we're all aware. Yeah, so um, we have an application in for uh, CPA money that we submitted on the 30th. So that is uh, currently under your review. Um, we presented to the trust in advance of the CPA application. Um, they have indicated that they intend to, to write a letter of support with the CPA application. Um, we do also intend to talk to the um, reparations assembly. I think this is a, a project specifically when it comes to the first time home buyership and the, um, the home buyer preference that's set by Commonwealth builders and really is the intent of this project. Um, you know, having, having an alliance there, I think makes a lot of sense for this project. So um, you know, we also do intend to talk to them. So the trust was favorable um, and they now have a copy of the CPA application and intend to discuss it at their meeting on the 13th, I believe. How much so. are you asking for? I forget. $750,000. Thank you. Um, again, kind of going back to the funding and how this works, Commonwealth Builders is the largest subsidy that we can apply for. And they do not allow us to apply for any other DHCD money. It's in written in regulations. So with construction pricing being the way it is, the gap on those restricted units is between what it costs to build them and what it costs, what we can actually sell them at based on the HUD um, income guidelines and thinking about somebody uh, not spending more than 30% of their household income monthly on a housing expense. Once we calculate all that out, there's very limited amount of money that we can ask for these units. I think the, the smallest unit, um, we can only uh, sell them at about $150,000. These are going to cost over $500,000 to build So at, at current construction pricing. So that's a huge gap for us to, to, to fill. So we are really looking to the town to help us fill that gap. Commonwealth um, Builders will provide us $250,000 per unit. Um, for that subsidy, but that still is not enough to cover current construction costs. So between CPA and um, Laura's had some initial discussions um, about ARPA money and how that might be able to, to, to fit in as well. Um, we are really going to be heavily relying on, on the town to help us fill that subsidy gap that we currently have because we have no other kind of place to turn to under the guidelines of Commonwealth Builders. How many units will be 80% and how many will be 100%? You so mentioned I, it was. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. I think it's 10 and 10, but let me just confirm. Okay, that's that's fine. You don't have to. Yep. And then just quickly, Jessica, you had mentioned that this is going to be a, a condo development. So really, um, you know, this will still be one property and then there'll be an association that manages everything. Is that... Anticipation. Yeah, so we'll yeah. we'll we'll create um, master deeds and deed restrictions under the the um, yeah. the condo uh, master general law regulations. Um, if it's helpful, I do have a camp uh, a sample deed writer from another Commonwealth Builder project on the eastern part of the state. It's in Boston, so it's a little bit different because of the different regulations under Boston. But it could give you a good sense of the restriction terms. And I do want to know, because I think this is important for you to understand, is the 30-year um, the restriction under Commonwealth Builders. Um, that's the, the max that's set under the program. The way that it is drafted, though, is that the town has a right of first refusal, so that if one of those units does go up for sale within the first 15 years, the town has the ability to reset the restriction. 
Um, and as long as it's going to be sold to a first time home buyer that meets those home buyer preferences. So, you know, there is the ability to extend those restrictions, but really the, the whole point of this program is to help black to increase black home ownership in, in the state. Um, you know, we, we are the sixth lowest um, in the nation in terms of the, the discrepancy between white homeowners and black homeowners. Um, and really this program is designed to help increase black home ownership. Um, and so we want to make sure that that is, is a major goal for us. It's a major goal for the Commonwealth Builder Program. Um, and we're hoping that that can continue. All right, great. So quick, one other, so there, I'm just throwing questions around for the accessible unit. Have you ever considered doing covered parking, like a like a you know something with a shed roof over just for the accessible unit? We can think about that. Um, and um, I had a question. So I understand this will be under 40B. Um, mm -hmm. What is uh, what is the use going to be? Is it going to be a cluster development, or is this going to be? Uh, whatever 30 to uh, 30 uh, duplex is um what makes the most sense do you think <laughs> it can't be a cluster development because no. you'd need a roadway yeah and you need lots you okay need okay individual lots so oh so it does seem like it's just going to be a 40b for 30 with, home. with and then the uses the use would be 30 duplexes yep or 15 15 right. structures so yeah 30 homes, 15 structures. Yeah. yeah. And did you did you say you had a couple of single family homes? I can't remember. No, no, that hasn't been our intent at this point. Okay. All duplexes. All right. Well, well, that's great. And then that'd be um let's just pretend that you were able to do this under a cluster if the use could be a cluster development. It sounds like there'd be a lot of waiver requests. Okay. Um and so if this is a do if it, this are going to be duplexes mm -hmm. um it there could be some waiver requests i'm not sure uh, but it'd be very small if any okay it really has to do down with the density i think is why we're under the 40b and the zones that they're under because we're building and we're flipping kind of the the density from the zones the zoning mm -hmm. wants us to cluster on the frontage we want a cluster in the back. Mm -hmm. And then just quickly for the wetlands piece, the one that's to the wetland to the south um, on the site, is that right? Is that a perennial stream? Like what is that that flows? No, it's, it, it's been, um, it's intermittent. No. Mm -hmm. Is it? Yep. Yep. So we don't have any riverfront. Okay. Yeah, I was just looking on the GIS and I know it is like a kind of. Yeah. A, yep. I checked it on stream stats too. It's definitely well below the um, the uh, basin requirements for a perennial. All right. Could I jump in, Nate? Um, I apologize, I'm late and I'll probably have to leave in a few minutes. I know Laura and I have not connected on funding, but I just caught the end of that CPA discussion. I guess one question for Jessica is, I, I heard you say the housing trust is willing to write a letter of support for your CPA proposal. Um, I will say a couple of things. One, this is probably gonna be Amherst's most challenging year in the history of the CPA. Um, we have never had more proposals than this round and we have never had more, um, the, total, the total ask um, is, is uh, extraordinary, I would say. Um, we also know that um, there will be, there are other affordable housing projects. So I'm just putting it out there that this is going to be, the CPA committee is going to have their work cut out for them. Mm -hmm. um, but did you, uh, so so my understanding is you asked for, what was it, 575? We asked for 750. Oh, under, 750 of yep, CPA. CPA okay. the, I think the 575 you're thinking of is the ARPA number that we have in our development. Right. So regarding the 570, or excuse me, the 750, so you're asking for CPA dollars, but you actually, you're, you're seeking a, a support letter from the trust, but you didn't actually ask the trust for any funds because the trust does control, Nate, my guess is close to half a million dollars right now. So certainly one thing I will tell you, one thing staff may be doing is saying to the trust, hey, uh, housing trust, um, you're sitting on 400 to 500,000. The trust actually asked for more funding through CPAC. 
So the question is here we have a, a viable project right in our on our radar screen right on the tarmac. Um, uh, why wouldn't the trust allocate some of the funds that they are currently holding to this project, which is, you know, well, well underway. So, so we do have in the development budget, I don't know if you noticed, but there is a line for $250,000 asked to the housing trust. Um, our timing was to see where we landed with CPA first. And then if there was a gap in that CPA request, then we would go to the trust and see if they would be willing to bridge that gap for us. So we will be going to the trust. We were, we want to see where CPA lands first before we go to the trust and make an mm. ask. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, just back to the site, you know, the, that house right there, the Jeffrey Fishman, and then the one on four ball lane, I guess they're two Jeffreys. Yep. Uh, the especially the newer one, there's no buffering to the site. So I don't know if you're proposing like plantings along, you know, that yeah. one, and then even the four ball lane, there's a few trees, but maybe, you know, if, um, you know, more plantings or something would yep. be helpful for both of those. Yeah, we, we had a really great meeting with, with Jeff and Sarah, uh, Tom, Peter, and myself, we met with him, uh, we met with them um, the Friday before the barbecue, the donut barbecue, and got their feedback and, and presented concepts. So we had got some good feedback from them. They are, um, it was a great conversation. I think we need to just land in a place. We're trying to make everybody happy. We'll see if we can do it. Um, but absolutely buffers and screening have already been part of the conversation, but the, it's, you know, is it fencing? Is it plantings? You know, how far away is this road? Do you want parking next to you or parking behind you? Would you rather look at a house? Would you rather, you know, there's a lot of um, back and forth that we're having with them. You know, if there's a fence and there's parking behind you, you're just looking at sky. Is that your preference or would you rather look at a house? You know, so we're trying to have those conversations with them to 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 land somewhere that um, makes everybody comfortable. But yeah, we're definitely very cognizant of that for sure. I have not had an opportunity to talk to the folks yet at um, Four Ball Lane, and that is on my to-do list for sure, and to get their feedback. Mm -hmm. Just uh, quick, yeah. So quickly, uh, another question: If you have access where the Matusco, you know, the driveway is, where the trucking was, yep. I don't know when the speed limit increases, but would we make a, Jason? Would it be the case that we would want to request a slower speed, at least up to Pulpit Hill, or did that already change? Like I forget how fast the speed limit is there. On Montague Road, you mean? On Montague Road, right, right. Like, is it? You know, I know it's, I know it goes up to fifty, right, just a little north yeah. of here, but I forget where what the speed limit is on this right on Montague Road in this area. Yeah, I don't totally know, um, but it's a state highway and they set speed limits based on road conditions and 85th percentile. So, so yeah, so if, so for instance, if we're saying, oh, we're going to have, you know, 30 new homes with a driveway on here, they may say on their own, like, okay, we should reduce the speed or they say it's fine right now. Right. I mean, it's, it's the kind of their decision. Yeah. They won't bat an eyelash at 32 new homes. Yeah. No. I don't think people slow down until they get to Coles Road, right? Well, that's what I was wondering. Like, is it? Some, that. That's why I was wondering. Like, is it something we should try start? You know, address like some traffic calming if we're just going to have, you know, homeowners pulling out onto sixty three there. Um, back okay. to sixty three. I have a question for Aaron actually, um, because there is a, it's paved, but there is a swale, a paved drainage swale that runs along. Montague Road. Our initial wetland consultant who gave us just a very kind of initial peek at it flagged that as potentially under wetlands jurisdiction. Pave swale they flagged as wetlands yeah. jurisdiction? Well, they just said based on your local bylaw, it may be considered, I don't know, I can't remember huh. the details of it, but they had flagged it and I just wanted to bring it up before I forgot whether that's something we should be concerned about at all. Um, is there wetland vegetation growing no. along the sides of it? Yeah. No. I mean, I had a similar situation um, with a project down on Snell Street where we had a paved swale. And um, is the is the swale leading to a structure like a drop inlet or a culvert? There, or yeah, like there's that? an inlet Catch right basin at the bottom. Right Catch here. Got there's it. a there's basically an inlet in the wetland. Gotcha. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't consider a paved swale leading to a catch basin to be wetland. jurisdictional anything yeah. that we need to worry about okay yeah i mean right. I, I would i would say that the soil should be checked and that the bed should be checked um 
but if there are not indicators of that being hydric, I would not, I would consider that to be a stormwater conveyance. Okay. Have we removed the language storm flowage from the local bylaw yet? There used to be uh, some really weird language in the Amherst bylaw about storm flowage. Storm maybe, water. Maybe that's flow. what she flagged for us. Yeah. That was that's where that question mark comes in. Yeah. I mean, so if it was stormwater flow on a natural substrate that was, you know, vegetated, um, I think we would have to apply common sense. I know there are some like in in the Wetland Protection Act, um, and I know that this has been brought into our local bylaw with the latest revision is that structures that were designed as stormwater structures, we consider to be stormwater structures. And I know that the Wetland Protection Act was updated to include that. As far as my application of how that the bylaw is written, I would apply just simple common sense. So if, if for example, it's a um, vegetated area and I can see flow in it like a stream, I would say there's a hydrologic gradient, I can see right. stream flow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in a in a paved swale, I, the assumption for me is that that was that was designed to be a stormwater conveyance right. um, to direct water probably from the road towards the stormwater treatment. Mm -hmm. um, I can have another look at the bylaw, but just okay. as far as uh, historic interpretation, since I've been here, that's how I've looked at it. Okay. Um, unless there's hydric soils or wetland vegetation. Um, I, I would lean towards stormwater on that on that okay. specific type of situation. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification on that. Um, we are almost at 2.30. You have spent a tremendous amount of time with us, and we are internally grateful for that. It's awesome. Um, do you have is there anything else that we should be thinking about that we haven't talked about? Any but oh, just quickly, timeline. Are you, I mean, oh, this yeah. wouldn't come through permitting until next year. I mean, yeah, what's I think. A yeah, we're, we're, you know, affordable housing, we're on the long game, right? So, <laughs> um, so we are going to be working on design the rest of this year. Uh, I would like to have a, um, the PEL application into the state by early next year, permitting next year. Um, we'll be doing all of our community outreach, um, continuing to find financing for the project. Um, once we've got everything kind of in the permitting's in place and the financing's in place, um, the, then we can go to the uh, Commonwealth Builders. We need to have everything else kind of lined up first. Uh, we've already had multiple conversations with them. We're in their pipeline. They know we're coming. So um, once we have that funding in place, we should start building in like 2024 and have all the units constructed and sold by 2026. Is there any ideas for housing choice, Nate? I know that you reached out to me a while ago about when the last housing choice round was coming along. Does it make sense to think about something for sewer upgrades or? Yeah, I mean, so the state, you know, they bundled um, housing choice and mass works and a number into the, you know, they're due in the summer. So we submit a, a letter of intent in the, I don't know, like spring or something late winter. And then we submit a full application uh, maybe in June or something. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think it could be, uh, you know, it's up to 250,000 housing choice for capital um, project. I'm assuming we'll be a housing choice community next year and we can apply. So I get, you know, I think it, it is something that's possible in it. Okay. It doesn't even have to be related to housing, right? But I think if it is, then it's just a, makes it more competitive. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's, um, I mean, it's interesting. They like to see it as um, it has to be on public property and oh. for, pu for public infrastructure. So, um, you know, the whole thing about Ball Lane and if that's not public or not being used by the public, then I'm not sure how eligible that is. It might have to, you know, so it's there's probably some things to look into, like what is what would actually be eligible? You know, is it sidewalks then or is it, you know, anything within the right of way? Um, originally, I was thinking, oh, if Ball Lane is stays private but there's public access easements then that might qualify but if really ball lane is not being used at all as part of this development then i don't know how much housing choice can um you know can work but i think that's something we can talk about over the next few months just to see okay. where 
Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, you know, public utilities, even ball lanes private, the utilities are public, right? I mean, that's sort of where we're kind of landing, it sounds, right? So there may be opportunity there. Um, our land use attorney has already kind of flagged the, that legal issue of using, not having, you know, a legal document in place and how that may throw off title insurance down the road. So um, I think if we can kind of clear up the, the language now, way in advance before we get to closing, I just don't want to get to a closing, be ready to go and then be like, oh man, there's this title issue that we has to, you know, ball lane, using utilities and ball lane, this is going to throw off title. So it'd be awesome if we can kind of try to figure that out now so that we're not stuck later on. If we have to get easements, that would have to go, if we have to get like official easements, they'd have to go through town council. Right. Um, as a sort of a taking almost. Right. Um, but it's, I think that's all, it's all doable and, and it might be the best course to take without, with all the vagaries of the history. Right. The prescriptive easement, would that still have to be a piece of paper? Uh, that is the, it's a very loose legal argument. It that okay. almost has to be a, an actual court decision to okay. award you a prescriptive easement. So it has okay. to be First, it has to be contested, then it has to be argued, then oh. it has to be a, so that's a whole horrible. Okay, other, so that's a whole other take. can of worms that, that sounds usually even legal, worse than just getting an easement. It's usually a legal interpretation by okay. a judge that grants you that prescriptive easement. You can argue it all you want up front, but sure. you have to take it to court to get it official. Oh, well, we don't want that. Okay. Right. Nobody, okay. There's nobody contesting it yet, so. Okay. Yeah, I just want to really avoid a situation where we're ready to close, we're ready to go, we're ready to start building, everybody is like geared up, and then, you know, we come to a screeching halt because there's no official paperwork right. um, allowing us to be able to do infrastructure improvements, so, mm -hmm. okay. So that doesn't need what to be formalized. What about the issue of initial local preference? What do you have to say about that? And does Commonwealth, whatever it's called, um, Commonwealth have anything? Builders? Commonwealth Builders, yeah. I know in the case of 132 Northampton Road, DHCD had to agree to the initial local preference. So does Commonwealth Builders have a say in deciding in this case? And how? what is your approach to that? So um, we haven't spoken with Commonwealth Builders specifically about local preference. Um, I think typically because Commonwealth Builders is allowed to be used in very specific geographic areas. One is qualified census tracts, which North Amherst is, which is why we're able to do this, um, gateway cities, and then some designated cities, um, Boston, and then a, a bunch of other uh, communities as well, that typically probably have a higher concentration of Black households than Amherst. So that being said, um, you know, this is a 40B process. If the town wishes to make that request, we would we would have to run it up to the flag with, with Commonwealth Builders. I can try to have some initial conversations to see how they feel about it um, and what their process is. I suspect it would be probably exact, very similar to DHCD um, in that you would have to verify and, and show proof of why the local preference is needed. So I, I would suspect it'd be a similar process. So that, um being able to say that you are willing to have a local preference may help with the CPA um, request and other requests for mon money from the town. Sure. It's a, it's a, it's a complicated topic for sure, local preference. Um, and I think it's becoming more and more of a, a complicated discussion. Um, and there are some cities and towns that are really taking a hard look at it. So looks like Laura has something she'd like to say maybe in specific to that. I don't know. Yeah, I Jess, you had pulled a really interesting study from was it Somerville or Newton? Newton. Newton. It would be great to share with these folks because it was a study that Judy Barrett did on behalf of the community of Newton about how the impact of their local preference was segregating. Um, and so I just feel like Amherst is poised at a time where you're looking at a lot of racial equity issues. And this is one of them. Um, this is right at the heart of it. Um, if you preference people who are already in your predominantly white community um, to become owners, and you favor that over people from other communities who are people of color, 
you're contributing to a pattern of se se racial segregation. So it's just something, I just think we all wanna be thoughtful about. Um, and I think Amherst, again, you're working on so many fronts to counteract racial segregation, but then to, to do this may fly in the face of some of those other efforts that are happening in your community. So it was a really interesting study. Um, again, we're not needing to make a definitive decision today. I just, I think it's one that we wanna just really take pause and, and think through carefully together. Mm -hmm. That's all. Sure. Thanks, Laura. Something totally unrelated back to the site. Are you, would you only have one building typology the whole time? So it's like the same unit, you know, like the same building repeated no. 15 times, or would you have no. uh, variations in the building? Tom can speak to this, but the idea is to have different story levels and to match it up in such a way that there's a there's a variation in the roof lines. So oh, there's ahead. yeah, so there's three different three houses, three different unit or house blocks. And one is a is a three bedroom, two story, one is a one and a half bedroom. Uh, sorry, one and a half story, two bedroom, and one is a one story, two bedroom. So they're basically in both size and shape and height. And those three different houses can be put together in clusters of two in any combination, really. So there, there really can be quite a few different um, configurations. Okay. And I just want to, yeah, I was just thinking that from, you know, a site design perspective, if it looks like that, you know, there's 16, anywhere from 15 to 17 buildings that are exactly the same. Right. Um, you know, the ZBA might say, well, could you consider varying it? And it looks like you, yeah. ha you have the, so it's so just, you know, we the have, concept in, plan, a, in addition, it? in addition to that, um, there's a difference in the, in the plan, whether based on whether, you're, because we're trying to do passive solar, um, there's a difference in the plan based on whether you're entering from the north or the south of the building, because that they kind of, the floor plan works out differently. So there's, a, there's increased variation based on, on how it's, whether you're entering south or north, or how it's configured relative to the street and the north and south narrows. All right. I just have one quick note about the demolition. I'm not sure who did the demo, uh, but they missed their utility abandonments. So once again, you guys have acquired a property that needs to have the water, a couple of water services abandoned uh, right. at Main and Ball Lane. Um, We'll work with you to help find them and figure that out awesome. when it comes down to it. Okay. Thank you. I'm gonna go fill up. I'm gonna go fill up right now, Jason. I'm gonna go bring some big tanks down there and just measure it out, and then yeah. we'll bill you. <laughs> Anything else? Any other comments? Anything that we've missed? Huge red flags that just N not a red flag or anything, but. Um... For some reason I love circulation, um, uh, but uh, it'd be interesting to see where your access uh, drives are and walkways are in relation to the bus stops. Like I, I just don't know where the bus stops are, but like, mm -hmm. are they? What's that look like? What's that walking distance? Um, and then, yep. and then from the parking area, what's that walking distance to the furthest dwelling? Um, I'm just thinking in context of your access drives is it strategic in a way that that makes sense in context of of those bus stops i don't know if that's needed but i'm just i'm yeah. interested in those topics <laughs> pulpit hill is the nearest bus stop the co-housing just past their drive Got it. actually so there's one directly across the street it's right oh, at the, they have one at the corner too it's okay. right at the corner so it's right at okay. pulpit hill and montague road and mm -hmm. it's uh i could even give you the line number i have it somewhere it's in the cpa application <laughs> Got it. Well, here's something that has to do with circulation. I'm thinking of Fire Island. I visited there a long time ago, but there's no car access. So people have wagons that they take their groceries to their places with. Um, is this development going to have any kind of system like that where somebody would you know, have their car in the parking lot and then they would have a wagon to take their groceries to their unit? Um, or is each person going to do that on their own? I think we were assuming people would do that on their own. I, I lived in the city for a while and had my own grocery cart that I would drag through the neighborhood to get my groceries. So I know what it's like for sure. Um, but I think our, our intent was people would, would figure that out on our own and we wouldn't do that for them. But it's an interesting idea. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a little shed where things are stored like that. I don't know. It's an interesting idea. 
I'm going to throw in my one last plug for Ball Lane to become public. I'm just just for Guilford's sake here. Um, there are two residents, two owners. I'm not going to say residents. There's one resident and one property owner that would love to have that road become public and get it paved for free. Um, so I'm just throwing that out there. They were in my office this spring arguing why why we were planning to stop plowing it and why we don't maintain the dirt road anymore. So you stopped maintaining the dirt road completely? We have. Will you yeah. be plowing it this winter? Probably. Um, and you said it's only one property owner that doesn't want it? Yeah, number 35, Lawrence Quigley. He's very adamant about not having not having it be a public way. He likes that it's dirt road. He likes that people aren't going to come down there looking for him. Um, and he's the last one. He's the last one. And he made a very interesting comment, which I have not been able to verify in the deeds. He seems to think that people only have access from like from Montague Road to the to the end of their property line. Hmm. And then like the next person has access to their property line. So in his mind, even if we were trying to use Ball Lane, we wouldn't have access all the way down towards his house. Interesting. So not usually how those are worded, but right. And I haven't been able to verify that, but that is that is what he in his head has told me that his attorney right. told him when he purchased the house. So uh, okay. another complexity to Ball Lane. Mm -hmm. And then uh, right across the street from him is where that existing single family home is. Correct. And I think where our challenge was is, you know, if it has to be a cul-de-sac, how that like if that is going to if that is an absolute for making it a public way, how does that work? How does it fit into our development? Mm -hmm. You know, Peter kind of played with the idea of turning that into maybe one of the main common open spaces right. that if that, you know, like trying to incorporate it so that it's not like just stuck at the end and mm -hmm. seems weird because it's a public way. So, you know, it, it's, it's, there's no clear, there's no clear design answer. We could end the public way before number 35. Pull the cul-de-sac further down. Potentially. And then and then it just turns into like a like this gravelly no man's land. Forgotten, forgotten part. Yeah. So that's possible. I don't know. It's a tough, it's a tough sell, I know. So we'll have to we'll we'll have to continue our conversations on that for sure. And definitely whatever the easement language needs to be, I feel like that's gotta knowing how long it takes things to get through any town council for a vote. Um, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's actually so, gotta have a proponent. Somebody's gotta push for that. And I think that's sort of gotta be you, unfortunately. Okay. And uh, maybe uh, with Ball Lane, this private Ball Lane, would that be considered, so your property, is that considered, I think uh, someone already answered this, but I wanna ask it again. Is that considered frontage? that fall yes. to, yeah yeah that's a private way before the subdivision bylaws were enacted is that right christine yep yeah, yeah so the way yeah the way we've been interpreting it for zoning purposes it's, it's frontage right i mean mm -hmm. you know for like a lot you know for that kind of thing it may not be you know considered a road for like we're talking about like public way or maintenance or other things but for zoning it is i think there's something else that the town engineer needs to declare like it's constructed properly for access to whomever it's giving access we had we ran into this on allen street over off heatherstone road mm -hmm. remember that with valerie hetzel you had to Very make great. some declaration to the planning board and then the planning board declared that it was suitable to have one more lot on it with frontage right. And I feel uh, seven P P's, if anyone's familiar with that, that was a Joel Greenbaum yep. project. Mm -hmm. And it looks like Laura, Laura, I don't know if you'd say a legacy hand or if you actually have another comment to it's make. It's just been up since she turned off her. A legacy video. hand, I haven't heard of that one. That's you like that? You like that? I that do was... like that. Just a leftover, <laughs> I'm gonna work on taking it down. It's the Zoom, it's the Zoom lingo I picked up. I haven't like been Googling. I love like, it. <laughs> That's hilarious. Legacy hand. Okay. We have taken up a huge amount of your time today. So thank you. Thank you for being accommodating with your schedule. Really appreciate it. Um, like I said, this is the first iteration. So I suspect we'll probably be coming back to you with more formalized plans once we 
start pulling things together a little bit. And I, if you if you would be willing to, we would like your feedback for our next iteration, if you'd be amenable to that, just to make sure that we've got all everything kind of queued up before we actually enter permitting. So I think we really appreciate having this opportunity to give our input early on. And it was so good to see this project, see your ideas for it, because we've been hearing about it through Nate and others, but we had, hadn't actually seen what your ideas sure. were. So it's been really fun and interesting to hear about it. Thank you. And feel free to reach out. If you anybody has questions as we move ahead, please, we are open, transparent about what we're up to. So please just let me know. Yeah, I talked to FIRE if you could, you know, they're going to be interested in like flows and, yeah. you know, just a lot, you know, the the things that could impact site design. So yeah, yep. I invited them. Um, so I'm guessing something ha is more major Happening. going on. And I'm going to share that. Well, I'll share the recording with everybody. But um, I believe uh, Tim Nielsen is away this week. Um, he sent me a quick oh, email about something okay. else and said, I'll, I'll get back to you next week when I'm back. So maybe uh, they're short. So like, maybe they're after. Something. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Maureen. All right. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All righty. Bye. Bye.